All right, um, we're really pleased to have uh, John Francis from Northwestern. He's going to tell us about how to integrate categories over three manifolds. Uh, thank you. Am I supposed to wear this? No, it should be. Yeah, okay. Good. Okay, and is there, are there are some. Oh, yeah, it's fun. No, where it's, I should be wearing it. It looks like throw the zero oyster. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks so much for the invitation to speak here and for having me here as a visitor. And so uh, delighted to be here and to, to talk to you all. If my phone goes off, though, I'm going to have to take it because it'll be my wife going into labor. So in which case, I might, might have to leave. But I, I think we might, we might excuse it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So uh, everything. So a few things. Everything I say. Uh, will be joint, represents joint work with David Ayal. So we're going to talk about three manifolds and knots and uh, some algebraic machinery for producing variants for three manifolds and dots, and everything will be framed. Um, but I'm, I made the uh, choice to not emphasize the framing. Uh, so if you really want to see where the framing is entering in some particular moment of the story, feel free to ask me, but I, I might tell some little lies as to where things are framed and not. Um, okay, so uh, years ago, uh, in joint work with uh, uh, Shiro Tanaka, we saw that uh, the following little piece of algebra gave invariance in homology theories for three manifolds of knots. So there's a structure called an E3 one out. Uh, which I'll write as a pair. And these things uh, give homology theories for an E3 one algebra gives a homology theory uh, for three manifolds frame three manifolds uh, with knots or links. So, as one of the the themes of uh, this this period is the analogy between uh, links and three manifolds, and ideals and uh, spec of a ring of integers in a number field. I will. Uh, if anyone has any ideas about what the analog for this story should be, please just shout it out. I'd be delighted to hear any ideas along those lines. Uh, so how, what's the, the heuristic construction? So the, uh, uh, the, the construction is followed. You can consider this space called the, the land space. Let's say M is a three manifold. Let's say M has some one-dimensional sub-manifold I'll call it H. So there's this thing called the rain space of M, uh, which is the sort of topological space of finite non-empty subsets. Yeah. And so the idea is that you can construct a Cauchy. On this space. So this space has been topologized so that points can collide. So it's some interesting space. It's not just a disjoint union of the configuration spaces. So it has some interesting topology on it. Um, so you can think of it as having uh, the strongest topology such that the maps, uh, say M, I, that takes the I tuple and records its image, that these maps are going to take. That's something. Um, so we can construct a clue sheet on this, uh, where if we think of uh, a particular point in this space, so this will be some uh, tuple, let's say x1 to xi, a1 to kj, where 
um, x uh, l is not equal to x l prime for l with l prime, and a r is not equal to a r prime for r prime. And these points uh, where the x uh, l are in are belong to m but not to k, and the k are belong to. So there's a so I've just written a, a general point of this, and we can, so I want to roughly describe what this Cauchy is in particular by telling you what the stocks are at this point. So at this point, so at this point, uh, the stock so a b uh, the stock of f sub a b is a tensor with itself i times, tensor b tensor with itself j times. So in other words, each point um, on M outside of K gets labeled, if you will, by A, and each point on K gets labeled by B. Now then you could ask, well, that makes sense for what the stocks would be, but of course saying, giving the data of a co-sheaf is not just telling you what all the stocks are, like how do these, uh, stocks get assembled. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, so they get assembled using this algebra structure. So you could, you could say, um, first I'll say, remind me what an E31 algebra is. So we can consider a category of three disks. Uh, so this has objects uh, which are finite disjoint unions of R threes, and everything's frame, so I say four. And morphisms are in bags. <clears throat> so uh, A is the uh, the data of E3 algebra is the data of such a functor from disk three. Uh, somewhere so it in particular, this is really determined by its value on a single R3. And then with multiplications uh, for each choice of an embedding, of two R3s into a single R3, so some phi embedding. <clears throat> Uh, well, this part of the axiom is that this is the value of A of R3 tensor with itself twice, given because there are two factors, and there is a multiplication. And so that's roughly what an E3 algebra structure is. Mm -hmm. But then there's another part, the B, and so one can upgrade this to, uh, to have a one-dimensional part uh, corresponding to some manifold K. Um, by adding in a uh, one right here. So I'll just throw that in, A and B. And so now there are some more objects. Or you might say two local types, these uh, disjoint unions of, let's say, finite disjoint unions of R3, and then an R3 with a line, which I'll think of this way. And now the embeddings have to preserve some spaces. And so the, uh, the value B, where B is some algebra, is really the value on this space right here. And so this has the structure of E1 algebra. And then when you put these two things together, saying that it's a function from this category, this is really equivalent to saying that there's an S1 family central A actions, um, central actions of A on B. So it's an E3 algebra, an E1 algebra, and this extra <laughs> compatibility of an, of an S1 family. So returning to what this does for you 
in thinking of how these uh, stocks you know, get assembled. So let's say that our um, you know, our three manifold looks like this, and then we had some uh, sub manifold look like that, and then show us some points. And we want to we want to say what the the data of these specialization maps between stocks are as this picture moves around in this space. So we can consider a little movie that takes these in the you know a path, in other words, in the rain space, takes these, and what's a legitimate thing that could happen is that um, say these two points could move together and collide into one point. And then another legitimate thing is for this point to move and collide with this point. So the so think that there was a, a movie witnessing a collision of points of X1 to K1 here. And then another We'll be witnessing a collision of of points uh, x two, x three here. And now the the stock of here is something different because now we had fewer points because of these collisions. You could ask how or um, how is what is the math the specialization math that relates this stock to this? Stock? Well, so we should present in this case a map from A to tensor three. Tensor with uh, B tensor two, in this case to um, A tensor two, uh, sorry, A tensor one, which is A, with B tensor two. And so on this factor right here, we'll split this up as A uh, uh, tensor B. Sir, A tensor two. <clears throat> and on this factor, well, we, um, in this category, we have a map if we're given an embedding of R3, R3, this line in it. So there's a, an embedding preserving subspaces like this into R3. The line in it so appears by R3, and there's the um, line, say, that I chose this embedding of this smaller R3. Uh, and then this embedding of a smaller R3 with a line in it. Why R threes look like R twos here? So there's such a such a map, and so maybe I'll call this U here. And let's say that uh, you can get such a picture here by um, by just thickening up these points and thickening up this line. So on this factor right here, we'll have U, and then similarly, uh, I wrote that we had an action before by choosing an embedding of two. Uh, Two copies of R3. So think of each of these as having two copies of R3, and then choosing a bigger one that contains both of them. And so uh, there, using this E3 structure, we will call this uh, psi. It'll be a map of psi. And then they'll just be the, the, the unit map. Because we didn't do anything to this last one, H. Uh -huh. So, um, uh, what would happen if X three is on the other side of this line? If X three, uh, well, this, <laughs> it was uh, it was three dimensional. Uh, 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 but but here's a really good. So this was a terrible picture because I was just drawing R three like it's the plane. Um, but so there is no other side, of course. However, um, maybe the, the the version of your question that you would have asked if my picture had been better um, is what about if X three had moved around the line and maybe came back. 
So that is exactly what you get from this S1 family. That's cool. And it, so if there had been R2 and I hadn't said, uh, and, and my pictures had accurately represented the situation, then your question would have been totally fair. And then this S1 would have been an S0. And so it would have been a statement that there were two different actions depending on which side of the line. So your question is very apt uh, for, for the case of the picture is more literally uh, represents. Uh, any other questions? Um, okay, so uh, so there's, there's some different ways of saying what this structure is, but um, the, the neat thing is that there's there are some pretty interesting examples. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Um, so I said there was a homology theory, and so I should say what that homology theory was. The homology theory then, uh, so what we call uh, factorization homology, you can then sort of of this three man rule with this not in it um, is then the, what you might say, the homology of the ring space in that coefficients in the associated So that's one way of saying what this homology is. So, uh, so one of the neat things about this picture is that there's a uh, very interesting source of examples that I Worked out, uh, wrote about a long time ago with uh, Ilan Costello and Owen Gwilym. It's right there. So if you have any questions on this one, please. <laughs> um, so if so, A uh, in this case is a deformation. There is an E three deformation filtered filtered E three algebra. Of cochains on a semi-simple culture. So of the alpha homology. And then if given V um, a uh, representation, uh, dualizable representation. Of the big quantum group. So then you can take endomorphisms of V. And this pair forms an E3 Uh, so you ask, well, that's uh, good, but what, what is then? What is the factorization homology? What is the homology theory you get out? And so we described this uh, in the particular case where there's a a, a, a a pretty good statement in the particular case uh, where your three manifold is just R three. And you've considered some uh, not in it uh, that might, let's say that it's uh, R2 uh, times uh, you know, times R2 times D1, say, um, but we'll just, uh, I don't know. And this knot is allowed to intersect with the D1, so it's some tangle uh, here. Um, and we'll just take the interior. So if we pass to this interior, then this factorization homology in V 
is really simple. It's so simple that you might wonder why we bothered to have such a fancy definition. Uh, it is Uh, equivalent to just um, from V tensored with itself a bunch of times, counted by the say ingoing uh, components, and V tensored by itself, counted by the number of outgoing components, uh, where this is signed. So if um, so, there's a framing on these things, and if there's so all these points are plus or minus. So I mean, if it's a minus, take the so, uh, so that's a pretty simple object. For instance, V itself could have been just the unit, uh, in which case this is you know just the ground field. Uh, or V could have been simple, uh, in which case endomorphisms of C of C. And so again, this is the ground field. Uh, so you produce something extremely simple. So you, like I said, you might ask, well, why I go to all this trouble of uh, of calculating something extremely simple and by such complicated means. Um, but the, the, the key thing is that this has a really interesting element. I'll call one, uh, essentially because these are you, these algebras are unital. And so this comes from the unit. Um, I want you to think of this as being like a trace map right here. So you can take the, the trace of the unit. And then that gives you an element here. You could ask, well, what's that element? And so what we, uh, what we prove is that this is the, um, the witten reshitin uh invariant uh, of the theory be evaluated on. So Rashid and Tariah sort of inspired by Witten's uh, Chern Simon's Joan polynomial work, figured out how to take a, a dualizable object in a braided category and produce an invariant of dots and lengths. And that's what uh, by cutting up, and that's what we that's the invariant that we produced there. So we uh, that paper, we did that an awful lot of time ago, and the paper is almost done. <laughs> so, so. So, that, um, so that's the story that um, we did and that I, I really like. You know, I got really excited about this when he thought about it, but there's some limitations to this. So one of the limitations was that this was necessarily a formal parameter right there. So you might ask, what about roots of unity? Uh, what about the more sort of, you know, more general theory of quantum groups. And um, uh, it's the endomorphisms in the category of representations. So yeah, no, it's it's end in rep to uh, U H So it means then it will be C. It will be C. <laughs> and, and what is the S1 family? Ah, so that, um, it's not, I, I wouldn't say that it's obvious that there is such an S1 family. So that was one of the things that we had to prove. Yeah. So, so. It's a good question. I'm afraid it's too good of a question right now. Uh, any other questions? Hopefully less good ones. Why did each bar have to be a formal parameter? Uh, so essentially it had to be a formal parameter um, in order uh, six. Um, do you want to take this one that one? Um, so I think John's heading towards trying to allow things not to be a formal parameter. Um, but the construction we're interested in is literally just studying these deprivations. Formal so, so when we check these things here, we end up doing some diagram computations. Maybe another way of saying this is that um, this is appearing as an algebra of observables. 
um, which is a formal deformation. And so in order to get an E3 algebra, like that appears as formal deformations of commutative algebras, and we're just not, there is some, isn't a corresponding uh, rich object that captures some more global deformation. Just if you take finite dimensional representations of the quantum weight of the unit transmit of Right, there's, there just isn't an E3 algebra such that filtered modules for that filtered E3 algebra is equivalent to representations. But there is a for a form of parameter. Is there just a finiteness problem or? Uh, it's, a, it's a problem of Kazool duality. And Kazool duality works formally. Right. But it doesn't work non formally. Uh, so the question is, can you, can you this be done, uh, you know, sort of non-formally, you know, for, Not over a form parameter. So that's that's what our story is about. So now this uh, sort of in, this movement from this kind of formal infinitesimal case of an E3 algebra to a more global object like this category. Uh, is mirrored by this following shift in the geometry. So in this, this case that I've just been describing, this sort of alpha case, um, so here we have a modulating space of points. There's rain space. And here in this, this beta case, Beta case, so, so in this, this E31 algebra, this beta case we will replace um, the uh, the E3 algebra by a rigid braided category together with the choice of object. And here we replace this moduli space of points, moduli space of graphs. Or if you like, of string diagrams. Or maybe even better of find the diagrams. But. So uh, before we just had points moving around, and you could say that clearly that was not going to uh, just the moduli space of points as a homotopy type or as a stratified homotopy type doesn't capture everything. What captures more is a moduli space of graphs. So, let me tell you the three uh, here. So there exists suitably interpreted, uh, so heuristic version of the theorem, there exists a moduli space. And, uh, and for, for M is a free manifold, um, for any one-dimensional subunit, uh, and for any R rigid braided, so a braided module infinity category, in which every object has a dual and a choice of object, 
there exists a Cauchy to do the interpreting. So, the space of graphs. Um, uh, such that, uh, say that the stops are what you hope for. Now I'll describe what you hope for. Is this specific to 3 1 or is there a version? Uh, so this is, uh, so 3 should be n. And then this would be en minus one, and so that's the that's the things more general than that are true, but that's what I'm asserting today. Uh, that's what's come out in uh, some paper. Uh, so say so here again as my. Uh, lackluster picture of a three manifold. So inside of here, uh, L. And so the uh, a, a picture that we're going to have. So these graphs uh, will will require that the graph refines L. So L is a subspace of the graph. So, so here's a particular gamma graph uh, and a L is K. So it's some So there, there is a, a point in this graph uh, space, in the space of graphs. And now uh, let me tell you how you're allowed to label it. Or so what, in other words, what the stocks, stocks are. So for each one of these points, uh, this, so the points, the vertices, labeled by, um, Morphisms of R. The edges we labeled by objects of R. <clears throat> um, and if the uh, edge belongs to K, then it has to be labeled by P. Now there are uh, source targets, so you might ask what happened right here? So let's say that in this picture, uh, and, and then the stock is all possible. Variables. So what might happen right here, let's say that uh, this was labeled by an object X, this right here was labeled by an object Y, this is labeled by an object C. Then you can ask what, and this will be labeled by some F, but there's some compatibility as you might imagine between all of these. So in this picture, F was a um, morphism from say, X tensor Y to C. And how exactly that um, worked in which the directionality was uh, had to be framed. So the framing tells you about directions. Why is it important to be here? Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, and then here we have. Thank you, thank you. So why? So this was uh, X. So in this case, so here there'd be some Y. There would there'd be some Z. Then there'd be some G, and that's all. So the so the stock so the stock of uh, let's call it uh, 
Cauchy F square root of R comma V. So the stock of F R V at gamma is all uh, late lengths. That satisfy these rules, these source target rules, uh, these these kinds of rules, what and so forth. And this rule all of it I want to recall. Right. Um, and then this gives once we have once you have this, then this gives the definition that the beta factorization quality or just the factorization quality of this. Uh, more sort of enhanced version of it, this more complicated version of it. Uh, sub M with this one dimensional discrete manifold, the one dimensional sub manifold. RV is then the homology of this space of string diagrams with coefficients. Uh, in this, this all labeling and how are you providing them? Uh, there's a, a, a well, there's natural topology on R. You know, it's any braided thing. The underlying space of objects has a topology, the underlying space of morphisms has a topology. So it's that kind of I just meant, sorry, is it a tensor product or a direct sum? Uh, well, it depended on what the uh, what R was in rich end, I'd say. Um, but you know, it's it's something that follows the same rule as that we had before. So, like, think of it as being a tensor product or whatever the wood window window structure on what R is in rich end. Josh, is there a, a slick way to describe the topology in this the way you did for the one space or? No. Uh, actually, Owen and I were just talking about that. <laughs> um, but uh, all right. But let's talk about it later. But yeah, there should be um, so just as the there's a tight relationship between the Bice topology of Kevin and Owens and the uh, topology of the Rand space. You know, I imagine that you could say something similar for this graph space. Okay, so uh, how do you prove it? So when you said that um, before, when you were doing the perturbative kind of, but this isn't, am I supposed to imagine that like now you have these graphs that can like touch different parts of K that are far away from each other, and that's what? Uh, uh, so I don't think it's the the, the the geometry doesn't tell you whether it's perturbative or not. Um, whether it's perturbative or not had to do with the construction um, of the coefficient system. So I, I, I wouldn't say that like braided categories versus braided categories that are generated under co-limits by the unit are perturbative versus not perturbative. Um, I, don't, I don't have any sort of way of making that statement. So it's not, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't say that the graph space is inherently not perturbative. And the brain space is inherently perturbative, but a lot of things do wind up lining up that way <laughs> practically. Okay, so how do you prove this? So again, um, in this graph space, it's very convenient technically to uh, thicken things up a little bit and actually think of the bunker agent of these graphs. So if we have some graph here, so the Poincaré rule. This graph um, here, well, this will be some, uh, since this is Poincaré duality in three dimensions, uh, think of this as being Here, uh, a three ball in which 
the boundary has been removed except for three patches. One of these are R2s. These R2s are, um, don't think of these as being all to these lines. And then this R3 as being the fall as being equal to this one. Uh, so one can instead view this moduli space as the sort of moduli space of operate data. And uh, and so sort of R2 now sort of represents uh, uh, or so, say R2 represents the, the morphisms. <clears throat> and R3 sort of represents uh, 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 sorry, sorry, <laughs> mockery duality. Uh, I kind of get to mix up on this. Sorry, R2 represents the objects. Of R and R3 represents the morphisms. So there's a uh, category we'll call D23 that assembles the, uh, these, these kinds of objects. And when morphisms, so if these objects are the Poincaré duals are equivalently, basically equivalent to a graph, the Poincaré dual of graph, the morphisms, I didn't tell you too much about what the paths in this space should be, but the paths should represent deformations of graphs. So the morphisms will correspond to one parameter deformations. Graphs and you say, oh, uh, which kind? Deformation. So here's an example. I'll draw this on the graph side. So here's an example of a deformation. And you can ask what should happen to the labeling data here. So here in this uh, so deformation, let's say here was gamma. It's a very particularly simple graph that I've kind of skipped the embedding into M and I've only drawn this deformation. So gamma zero to gamma one, or gamma to gamma prime, so the deformation of gamma. So, so gamma, as you've drawn it, is like a bivalent graph with two vertices and three edges. That's that's right. That's right. Um, and you know, stuff could happen over here. I'm just going to think of it as being a piece of some graph. Uh, so here in this picture, uh, this sort of most basic picture of how we're going to might deform a graph. So all of these had labels. Uh, these were uh, labeled by some morphisms, say F and G, X, Y, and Z. Um, and so uh, uh, here, what happens uh, with this is we now composed F and G there. So, pardon me? Z, like the same. Z. So in this, um, and so when you think about how this interacts with the labeling data, with the stocks of this, so composition um, in the, of, uh, of the labeling data in R will correspond to, uh, let's say, a sort of creation definitions, or sorry, collision definitions. So colliding, just like in our algebra case, when we took two points and we collided them and we asked what happened with the labeling data, that due to multiplication in the algebra. So this is uh, or this is a, a strict generalization of that as we collide strata, simple cases of, of strata, these graphs, we uh, compose the labeling. Okay, so what would the, so the statement we need in order to, to produce this, to say that there exists this a well-behaved co-sheaf is we need to produce uh, 
we need to, so this is our sort of category of labeling data, all the sort of structure that you need in order to, to, to do this labeling process. So, so we need to bring the category to the differential topology of labeling data and say that given R, there exists some functor that I'll maybe also call R, uh, it's the infinity category of spaces or whatever we're trying to enrich them. So I'll just do the simplest case of spaces, but there, there's a, an enhancement of this if it's enriched in some other category. So what kind of thing is three? Is it a category? Uh, this is an infinity category. Uh, such that R is value on R2 as the objects of R, the space of objects. And R um, on uh, uh, say R on R two times an interval are the the mechanisms. And similarly, you need want to describe it's the values on everything here, but in particular, that's this kind of structure. So there is, there is a construction. Uh, essentially, what you can do is you can construct a functor from uh, some indexing category for higher categories that we call cellular realization. So then there's functor back, sort of a restricted UNATA functor, we call frac C um, uh, to infinity three D. Let's say this a little too fast so that I can get to the punchline. Uh, so, so by so this restricting taking the restricted DNA to this thing uh, uh, gives such a functor, and so then saying this is then equivalent. We're asking for, say, this right here is then equivalent to saying that aha uh -huh, from frac C of R2 in higher categories uh, to R suitably interpreted is the objects of R. So that's, that's, that's the kind of thing that you need to show. You need to produce this some functor from this labeling data to higher categories or someplace that R also lives. And then once we're in here, there's some notion of functors between these kinds of objects and R itself. And we need to say what those are, that, that it's something comprehensible. So this. Uh, so you might think that you're almost done, and in fact, you are almost done, uh, except that, uh, well, we need to identify what fraxy of R2 is. All right, just to make sure I'm following this, R is started like as a, as a braided category. Uh, yeah, so to view it here, you take its double D loop, you regard okay. it as a three category. Yeah. Um, or uh, I, I could have said this differently. You could also say it's uh, a little less natural. You could say that this functor goes to braided. But you can double yeah. it because it Yeah, you can, in this case, you could say that this winds up through some uh, I should have said this, I should have said it this way. So from that functor, you can then do, you do one more maneuver and say that frac C lands in braided categories, and this is hama braided categories. And again, you want to say that that's the objects of R. So here's the thing. Frac C, when you work out what, uh, what it comes out to according to these definitions and constructions, is the tangle pattern. So the infinity category uh, of tangles uh, in in 
in three-dimensional space. So the objects here are points in R2, and the morphisms are tangles in R2 times in uh, three space. And so then this assertion right here, this is the tangle hypothesis. So you just have to prove the tangle hypothesis. <laughs> So saying that this labeling data works the way that you think it should is sort of just a proving a tangle hypothesis and then a version of the tangle hypothesis object in, object in here, and then you're you're good to go. So so that's what we did. So then we proved the tangle hypothesis. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we did that. What time should I stop? Four minutes, please. Okay, so this this theorem, this uh, pre theorem, um, more or less reduces to the, the tangle hypothesis, the the case of the tangle hypothesis for uh, the one dimensional, so the one dimensional tangle hypothesis. So you know. Tangle hypothesis. So this category of one manifold in uh, in three space is three uh, braided, say two braided, rigid category on a single hypothesis. That's just another way of saying. That's just exactly the same thing as saying that. Um, of, uh, so this is the thing in universal properties. Maps out of it are just the same as saying where this point goes if the target is rigid and braided. Um, so this is just a restatement of, uh, of the composite of these two things right here. So here's uh so 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 I'll tell you a little about the proof since I have six and a half minutes. Uh, so there are two parts. So one, so we prove this by induction on the two. So we started off with one. So first we prove for one frame by one. This is pretty rigid, but just in this case, just one annoyed category generally. And this is a lot easier because both sides are discrete. They're just ordinary categories. There's no topology. There's no difficult differential topology, right? And here, because you're just dealing with embeddings of a one manifold into R2, and that space of embeddings is contractible. Like it has to be, each component is contractible. So what everything that makes the story difficult um, on the differential topology side is not an issue here. So we start off with that. Then what we do um, is we do induction. We describe what the induction from E1 algebras to E2 algebras of the Fordism is. And this kind of brought us into some pretty neat differential topology in calculating this induction. So, but initially, I was I was kind of intimidated by, by this induction because uh, I was like I had not thought that there too much that there could be a really clean formula for inducing from you know e one algebras to e two algebras or e k algebras to e n plus k algebras. But it turns out there is a really clean kind of formula that we figured out, and so we evaluated this in a few steps. So two a, so. You can, so this is really, uh, you think of this as being a simplicial space, right? Use some more words here. Um, this is a space uh, that uh, involves the spaces. So we can consider this, the, 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 this is a simplicial space where it'll be the, uh, the E points. Maybe I'll write it this way. So this is a one disk that uh, has P plus one points 
pickled out, and then we took a pick of product. R1, and so we can consider board one of this, and by that I mean it's just some uh, collection of, uh, of one-dimensional submanifolds in this that are transverse to these slices. And so this is the key points. Of board one of R1. So, but this is just a space now. So in other words, you can, you can try to understand this induction just on key points at a time. And so this produces another special space, which is board one, I'll call board one framed uh, R2, slice-wise projective embedding. So this consists of uh, knots in R2 or tangles in R2, such that you can, in the second coordinate, slice it up into a bunch of pieces such that each piece then projects to an embedding in R1. Okay, so that's one step. So then this thing, however, does not satisfy the Siegel condition. Uh, it's very far from being an infinity category, it's just a simplicial space. And so then you can uh, Siegel of one frame R2. Slice wise projection of that So, that, in general, Siegelifying a simplicial space to get a uh, Siegel space is, uh, is a pretty gnarly construction, but there's a construction that sometimes works. And in this case, it works. Uh, and when that construction sometimes works, it's a, it's a good thing. And so, this works out to another really neat piece of geometry. So this produces uh, what, a call, what we call um, the projection immersion. So it consists of links um, or knots in R3, uh, such that when you project it down to R2, it's an immersion. Um, but now there's a problem because we wanted the end of this to be just the usual Bordism category, and instead we produced this ordered projection immersion bordism category. So then uh, that leaves the last part, which so there's this functor of Siegel spaces. So this this thing right here, the projection immersion, um, is is not an infinity category. It's not univalent. So there's uh, uh, a natural transformation of Siegel spaces, and this is an equivalence after you know the So when you take the left hand object and force it to be an infinity category by uh, forcing the space of objects and the space of isomorphisms to be the same, it pr produces this. Uh, and this is actually the <laughs> From a differential topology point of view, maybe like the cool, like the part that I enjoy the most in this, um, because uh, this is actually a, a relative in each principle. So we sort of have to go into um, Gromov's proof of the H principle, uh, to which works for immersions, um, to actually imply to something called the bedding embedding immersions. And so if you like go into the proof and fiddle around with it, you see that the proof just works exactly the same uh, and that there's a relative form of the H principle. And that relative H principle applies here to say that these things, uh, um, to say that the mapping spaces here are actually homotopy equivalent to the mapping spaces here. Uh, thank you all very much. Questions. Yeah. I, I have two questions. Um, so you, you first explained the alpha case and then explain beta case of that, how to improve it. So how do you go from beta case back to back, from beta vector data homology to back to alpha vector data homology? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, you so there are uh, you might say two <laughs> ways 
Um, the uh, so so maybe the the most uh, so there are two ways which are the same or equivalent. Uh, so given an E three algebra, uh, you can uh, uh, you can de loop it to get a three category. And so that three category is actually what you input into this story. So you have also you take a Brady category and you de-loop it to produce a three category. And so now those two things are just living in the same place. And uh, the beta version with that three category input is the same as that alpha version with that three category. So that's that, that's one way. My second question is uh, what what's the relation to scaling model? Is, ah, is yeah. Data yeah. So the uh, conjecturally, which uh, you know, I don't think should be too hard to prove once everything is finished, um, as far as setting it up, um, is just that H zero of factorization homology is the same. I think I missed something you said when you were doing two. So um, once you have one, you did this induction on the left hand side. Do you also do the induction on the right hand side of the three rigid? Ah, ah, right, right. So this thing is it, it's, it's, it's 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 more or less obvious um, because the induction has a universal property. It's a left adjoint, and so the free thing also has it. So it's more like the composite of left adjoints is a left adjoint. That's so this is so you, you just need to check that that also preserves the rigid condition, but it does. Okay, so this is. Um, it's yeah, it basically follows from universal properties that these are. Yeah, so I should have said that next for oops. So your category is the uh, is the category of modules for rec UG and a ring unity. And you compute that you get the uh things are the variance. Uh conjecturally. Also true. But I, think we, like this I, but I think he was asking that question since we had already gotten the variance at a formal parameter. Any more questions? I think John again for yourself.